before I start taking uh, start with questions, I have a couple of things I want to bring up. Uh, first of all, it's a very sad, sad day here in the White House press office. Uh, as some of you may know, the uh, delightfully droll and sartorially splendid Reed Sherlin is leaving us. This is his last day. Uh, he will be missed uh, by all of us, and uh, and I've only worked with him for a short while. Um, a lot of folks have worked with him a lot longer, and he is. Uh, I, I know that he helped a lot of you over the years here, and uh, uh, he's a, just a terrific uh, asset that we're losing. Um, so wish him well when you see him. <clears throat> Next, uh, I just happened to notice this the other day, and I thought I'd throw it out there because we all like a little good news. General Motors, uh, you may have noticed, is uh, by the fall going to hire back the final 2,000 of the workers that were laid off, um, which if you uh, remember where we were uh, just a few short years ago, uh, in terms of uh, the economy in general and the uh, American auto, auto industry in particular, it's quite a remarkable thing, and so we think that's great. Uh, I'd also like to uh, mention that the President uh, participated in a National Security Council meeting uh, earlier today uh, on Libya, uh, and also uh, will tell you that uh, in about 21 minutes he will uh, speak with uh, leaders of Congress about Libya in a conference call. And that is what I have for you. Mr. Feller. Thanks, Jay. Um, on that last point, can you tell us more about the call with Congress uh, who's taking part from their end? Uh, I, don't, I don't have a list because I think it, it will partly depend on uh, who's a, able to call in since uh, Congress is on recess, as you know. Uh, so um, we will provide a list to you after the fact. How would you characterize the It's part of the President's, uh, as I've talked about, part of his uh, uh, consultations with Congress, uh, part of the administration's consultations with Congress, and he will update them on uh, the situation in Libya, on uh, what we've accomplished thus far uh, since uh, the adoption of uh, UN Security Council 1973, and he will um, update them on the transition of uh, command and control to NATO, which, as you know, is uh, taking place as I speak. Uh, so um, I, I think that's the, those are the issues he'll cover, and obviously he'll answer some questions. By, there, bipartisan mission? Yes. Yeah. One follow on that, you just mentioned command and control. I'd like to try to get a little clarity on that. Um, the NATO Secretary General said yesterday that, quote, there will still be a coalition operation and a NATO operation. We are considering whether NATO should take on the broader responsibility in accordance with UN security resolution, but that decision has not been made yet. And then uh, a senior administration official said last night that NATO had, in fact, agreed to the entire operation. So can you clarify which, which Well, there are two aspects to this. Uh, the, the senior administration official is correct, but there, the, the, what has already happened and is occurring now is the transfer of command and control over the no-fly zone to NATO. That is happening. Uh, what has been agreed to, but the details of which, the military planning aspect of which has not yet been uh, finalized, is the transfer of the rest of that, the civilian protection aspect of the uh, of the military uh, mission. So that uh, we expect it will be wrapped up in the next couple of days, but it has been agreed to. So the White House position is that NATO will take control of the entire operation. It's just a matter of time on the last part. Well, it's the position of uh, our NATO allies and the coalition partners, but yes. Fisher? Syria. Mm -hmm. um, which way does the United States see Syria going, and what are you hearing from allies in the region? <coughs> Any concerns? What are their concerns? And does the White House still think that President Assad is still legitimate, is legitimate? We uh, strongly condemn the Syrian government's attempts to repress and intimidate demonstrators, and we are calling for uh, an immediate cease to the violence and killings of civilians at the hands of the Syrian uh, security forces. It's uh, the same position we've taken throughout the region, uh, and we condemn it strongly. Uh, we have obviously, uh, as we always do, consulted with our allies in the region, uh, and uh, we urge upon the Syrian government uh, that they pursue uh, a nonviolent path, that they pursue political dialogue, uh, because the future of this region depends upon, the stability and future of this region depends upon uh, the uh, decision by governments to listen to their people, to act, uh, uh, act on their legitimate aspirations, and to open up their systems so that uh, the people of these countries can uh, have a greater stake in the future of their country and their own futures. 
So they, we take the same position uh, with Syria as we've taken with others. We also, uh, um, you know, we're also deeply troubled by the arbitrary arrests of human rights uh, activists in Syria, uh, and we we, ought, we urge them to, to to cease that practice as well. Are you in touch with President Assad at all? I don't have uh, anything for you on that, um, but uh, you know we are making clear from here and, and from other places uh, what our position is. Okay. Um, GE in 2010 made more than $14 billion in profits, $5 billion here in the U.S., and yet GE paid no taxes last year. Given that the CEO of GE is the head of the President's Competitiveness and Jobs Council, I'm wondering if you have any thoughts on their paying no taxes last year as opposed to probably every single person in this room. I hope so. But the uh, – look, I, I, Jake, I'll, I'll just tell you, I don't know about the specific company's uh, balance sheet or its tax returns, but I, but I can I, – I've read the story. I'm saying I don't have uh, my own uh, assessment to make of it. But what I will tell you is that the uh, President has uh, said that he is committed to corporate tax reform and he wants to – do that uh, because it will improve our competitiveness, and he believes that one of the ways to do that, the, the way to do it, is to uh, you can lower the rate if you uh, and and still bring in the necessary revenue if you remove a lot of the loopholes and uh, other aspects of it uh, that make it complicated, uh, that uh, give companies uh, you know fits and, and also make us less competitive. Uh, in the process. So he's committed to corporate tax reform uh, because it's right for growth, it's right for job creation, and, uh, you know, he, he will have that conversation going forward. Does it bother him? I haven't spoken to the President about, uh, about this, but he is bothered by uh, what I think you're getting at, which is that um, Americans, I'm sure, who read that story or heard about it are wondering, you know, uh, you know, how this could be, and, and one of the reasons why it could be, again, not addressing the specific company because I don't know independently about that, but it is part of the problem of the corporate tax structure that uh, companies hire, you know, armies of tax lawyers to, to understand how it works and uh, to uh, take advantage of the various uh, loopholes that exist that are legal in order to reduce their tax burden, burden, and he thinks that in the name, uh, for the purpose of greater competitiveness and job creation, we have to address our, our corporate tax structure. Well, if in the name of competitiveness and job creation, the President feels we have to address our corporate tax structure, why appoint to the head of the Competitiveness and Jobs Council a person who is now the poster child for well, using the system to get out of paying taxes? The job Council and Competitiveness Council is uh, is designed for just that, and he has brought together uh, a lot of voices on that, and he uh, wants to hear uh, the opinions of every member of that uh, council. And we have said, in re with regards to questions about other members who have been appointed, that the president uh, obviously doesn't want a council of people who agree with him on every issue. He wants to hear diversity of opinion. In the end, the decisions that are made about which policy to pursue on corporate tax reform will be the President's decision uh, and his policy. Uh, so uh, I, don't, I think that addresses the question. But is there a perception problem at all for the President? He says he wants to take on this issue, and yet he very much wants to take on this issue. the second year in a row, I believe, that GE didn't pay any taxes, and yet he appoints the CEO to the head of his Competitiveness and Jobs Council. Is, is, I think, I think is, the issue, Jake, is, is cynicism that the American people No, because have? the President is very committed to addressing this issue. So much so that he puts the CEO of GE at the I head think, of his jobs and competitiveness council? Look, I think, you know, Jake, we can do this five or six times, but he is committed to corporate tax reform. He believes that one of the reasons why he addressed it before this story came out uh, or stories, you know, is, is because that this is not an unusual situation, that the, the tax code is complex, it's filled with loopholes uh, and uh, other pieces of it that make it uh, – possible for corporations to reduce their tax burden. And it's not good for the companies in terms of their competitiveness and potential for growth, and it's obviously not good overall for uh, job creation in, in the United States. So that's why he wants to address it. So, yeah. 
Um, it, the call that the president will be having with lawmakers, is that in direct response to some of the criticism that he's been getting from up on the Hill that, that these because lawmakers were not? Because you said it had to happen, Dan. No, it's, I'm glad, uh, I'm glad he's listening. it's part of, I, I won't go through it again today, but the list I read you um, yesterday of the series of consultations and briefings that the uh, president and members of his administration have had with uh, both leadership and rank and file members uh, and committee members uh, on the Hill, it's, it's part of that process. And he is, uh, he looks forward when Congress is back to having these uh, meetings in person, uh, but while they're on recess, he'll, he'll, uh, he'll, he looks forward uh, in just a matter of minutes to uh, updating them on our uh, progress, uh, all that has been accomplished, the lives that have been saved, the incredible speed with which we have done what we said we would do, what the President said we would do, which is transfer uh, command and control to NATO, uh, and, uh, uh, and then update them on um, uh, the progress or, or, or how we see things going forward. So, uh, but this is one in a series of consultations. You, you guys are listening to what's happening up on the Hill, the, the criticism. Uh, was there concern in the White House uh, about the ongoing pressure, if you will, for the President to uh, speak with lawmakers, uh, explain what he's doing? Yeah, I'll just, I'll just go back to what I said and yesterday, which is that we have uh, consulted with Congress. I read uh, a lengthy list of engagements uh, that members of the administration had with Congress on this issue. We understand that it's, uh, it's our responsibility. We take the need to consult very seriously, and, and the President will continue, continue to do that, as will senior members of his administration. Um, I will also say that uh, what I said yesterday, but it bears repeating, uh, that there was an urgency to act here. And had the President waited, given the preponderance of evidence that was available to everyone, uh, that Colonel Qaddafi's forces were about to move on Benghazi and wreak horrible damage and uh, kill many, many Libyans. Had he waited uh, for Congress to come back, had he waited for, a, uh, you know, more, taken more time to uh, debate and consult on this issue, uh, I think there's very little doubt that Benghazi would have fallen and that many people would have died. And he believes very strongly that he made the right decision. No-fly zone um, in, in Iraq, years of no-fly zone pressure did nothing to, to run uh, Saddam Hussein from power. And I'm wondering if in Libya, um, is, is the administration prepared for a long, drawn-out process where Libya remains under the control of Omar Khadam? Well, as you know, the, even the, mili the military mission that uh, is described in Security Council Resolution 1973 uh, goes beyond just the no-fly zone, as you know, uh, and it includes the civilian protection uh, piece uh, that enables, uh, well, enables uh, the coalition to do more to protect civilians uh, than, I believe, the no-fly zone allowed uh, in northern Iraq. Uh, secondly, as you know, on a separate track, it is the United States' position, the President has, well, has stated often, that Muammar Gaddafi is not fit to lead and that we believe he should leave power. And we are engaged in uh, a host of uh, actions, unilaterally and multilaterally, that are designed to put pressure on Gaddafi, to put pressure on those around him uh, and with the aim of the, that he will take the decision or those around him will take the decision that he has to go. And, uh, I, you know, we don't have crystal balls here and I can't predict uh, what the future will bring, but, but we will uh, stay focused on uh, those measures, even as the military mission uh, reaches benchmarks of success, and as the transfer occurs, we will continue with uh, the, uh, those tools that we have to put pressure on Gaddafi and his regime. So the administration is pushing for a coup? That's not what I said. I think we said that the uh, Libyan people, we have said the Libyan people need to decide who their leaders are. We think quite clearly that uh, Qaddafi has lost legitimacy in the eyes of his people, uh, not least because he has murdered his people in large numbers. Uh, and the purpose of many of the measures that we've taken, including financial sanctions and, and other measures, have, are, are aimed at putting pressure on him and isolating him uh, so that uh, he either makes the decision or those around him come to the conclusion that uh, the future is not bright for this regime and that its capacity to function is severely limited.
in the world. Uh, Jeff, Mike has to run to a live shot, so he's butting in line. Uh, I thank the gentleman. Please give him something to report. I thank the gentleman. How can I help you, Mike? Uh, you use the verb consult. You're consulting Congress. They, they've been complaining that you've been informing them, but not consulting. For example, the meeting last Friday that was here or by teleconference. Or some, members, some members were here and some uh, called in. So if you're consulting them, to what end are you consulting them? Are you asking them for congressional action, or why not just tell them what's going on and inform them? Well, we want to hear what they think, we, uh, and we want if they have suggestions about uh, things that we should be doing. Uh, we Obviously, the President wants to hear that. Uh, it is well within, as we've described and others have described, uh, well within the President's constitutional authority to take this military action. The precedent, uh, the list of precedents is uh, quite long. and. Uh, but he believes that consultations with Congress are important, and he does want to hear uh, uh, their thoughts about about the mission, about uh, the situation in Libya, and about uh, our overall policy there. Uh, and on the question of leading the coalition, uh, have we ever led the coalition? Are we still leading the coalition? When will we stop leading the coalition? Uh, we were a principal actor in the first phase of the military mission because of our unique capacity and capabilities. Uh, that were brought uh, to bear in uh, sort of creating the environment necessary to enforce a no-fly zone and uh, creating an environment where Gaddafi forces that were menacing cities like Benghazi and Misrata could be... Uh, I understand, but the principal actor leaves open the question of someone else leading. No, we were leading. I mean, there was no question that we were leading in the first phase. So we're first among equals. Or uh, well, look, it's a, it's a partnership, but we, we uh, at least in the early, the first several days, were uh, flying the majority of the sorties and, 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 and doing uh, the majority of the missions, although others were as well. And that ratio has been shifting day by day. And today, to answer your, the second part of your question, today, as I speak, the authority, command and control authority for the no, enforcement of the no-fly zone is being shifted to NATO. It will no longer be a U.S. lead. The authority for, there is an agreement for the uh, command and control over the rest of the mission, the civilian protection mission. Uh, there's a, an agreement at a political level, and the military plans uh, that are associated with that are being worked out uh, now and will be worked out in the next several days. I yield back. Um, just, I just want to follow up on that. As you, you, you say that the United States has had a leader, has been leading in the first phase, so that means the President, the Commander-in-Chief, has been the leader of this operation so far. Will he be giving up that leadership role as the transition happens? Chip, we have made clear from the start, from the moment the President announced his decision to take this, that our uh, role in the lead would be a matter of days, not weeks, uh, as we brought to bear our unique assets and capabilities to create an environment in Libya that allowed our allies to enforce the no-fly zone and our allies to take the lead in civilian protection. Uh, that process is underway right now, as he said. He said what he would do, and he's doing what he said. Uh, so I don't, I, don't, I, don't, I don't see the confusion. It's not confusion, really. It's just a lot of people, mostly Republicans, but even some Democrats, are uncomfortable with the whole concept of the United States and the President stepping back from a leadership role in such a major international <laughs> I think we've heard a lot of voices, Chip, about how we should approach this. Uh, one thing I know uh, 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 that the President believes strongly is that the wrong course of action would have been, in this country or other countries, unilateral military action to remove the leader of an Arab country. I am confident that most Americans think that would have been a bad approach. Instead, he pursued a policy where we uh, worked uh, very quickly to build an international coalition uh, that includes Arab support, vitally important, uh, to uh, launch this military action against Gaddafi's forces. Uh, it is the right thing to do, uh, it is the smart thing to do, and it is the best thing to do in terms of U.S. national interests in the long term, because uh, as, as I've said about Libya and other countries, it is vitally important that the unrest that we've seen and the transformation that we've seen in these countries that is unfolding every day now uh, be recognized for what it is, which is organic. It is about the people of these countries demanding to be heard, demanding greater rights, greater freedoms, and less repression. It is not about the United States of America. And that's not an, that, that's, that, that, making that decision is about leadership. It's about keeping your eye on the ball about what's in 
the interests of the American people, in our national security interests. The primary uh, purpose of all this was to prevent a humanitarian catastrophe. If it becomes clear that that is no longer an imminent threat, will the President pull American forces out? The uh, mission, as you just rightly stated, is to protect civilians. We're talking about the military mission. And uh, the United States will continue to participate in the coalition to enforce the mandate given by the United States, uh, the United Nations Security Council, Resolution 1973, uh, for as long as is necessary to make sure that those civilians are protected. We, as I've said in answer to Dan's question, are pursuing a whole host of other measures, unilaterally and multilaterally, with our partners to continue to put pressure on the Libyan regime, on the Gaddafi regime. And I just want to, one last question to clarify. Uh, the Pentagon says that U.S. pilots will, will, they anticipate that U.S. pilots will continue to participate in strike missions, not just surveillance, but strike missions in Libya, even after the transition. To whom will those pilots be reporting? Somebody well, I'll, other than I'll, Americans? I'll uh, refer you to the Pentagon for the specifics. I believe, as I've, I've said, that in terms of, uh, and, and I don't, you, the details lie across the river at, at, at the Defense Department, but but uh, it it is certainly the case that while we, the Control, command and control, uh, command and control uh, transition is still pending on the civilian protection aspect of this, that the United States will continue to fly sorties as part of that mission. Uh, and again, that's a matter of days and not weeks. Uh, in terms of our, it, it, we're, we're taking, we're, we're taking, this would go but, but overall it's about a lead role, okay? And I will refer you to the Pentagon to the details of what, what we will continue to be doing. But what we will not be is in the lead in either the no-fly zone or the civilian protection. Is the president comfortable having U.S. pilots report to foreign commanders? Well, uh, I think this president and the previous president was comfortable having uh, United States forces report to, to NATO commanders, uh, non-American NATO commanders in Afghanistan, and that's how NATO works. So uh, we feel very comfortable with uh, uh, the structure of NATO. It is, by the way, the most successful and powerful military alliance in the history of the world, and uh, we think it's uh, quite a good one. You said uh, yes. the broad coalition the president has built is the right, the smart, and best thing to do in terms of U.S. national interest group, but also appear to move more slowly than a coalition of folks more on the same page. Uh, is that just an acceptable trade-off? Well, Wendell, I would certainly say that it was worth the time to assemble a coalition. I would also say that the time uh, was pretty compressed. If you look at any historical precedent for this kind of action to be taken, this kind of uh, collective action by our international partners, there is no comparison at all. And I think in the past I have uh, given you a blow-by-blow blow of the comparison in terms of sanctions taken in Bosnia uh, or the uh, use of military uh, kinetic force in Bosnia and how long it took for uh, the world to act in, in those cases. And, and that's certainly true in a, in a host of previous examples. So uh, the speed here was, uh, I think, notable. Uh, and the need to do it uh, with a coalition of international partners was uh, essential. Given that, that it is U.S. policy that Gaddafi uh, has lost his legitimacy and, and, and should go, but that is not the, the goal of the U.N. Security Council resolution, one of the questions Speaker Boehner has is, can military action in Libya end with Gaddafi still in power? The, that's a question that depends on Gaddafi's uh, decision regarding the use of force and violence against his people, against the people of Libya. I dare say they're not his people. The uh, mission of the United States, uh, the mission of the uh, military coalition authorized by the United Nations Security Council is to protect Libyan civilians. And, and uh, that mission continues as long as Libyan civilians are uh, threatened by Gaddafi's forces. Meaning he stops threatening them? Well, look, I don't want to predict the future and how this plays out. What I have said is what the mission is. I have also, I think, uh, elaborated on what the other actions we have taken uh, and what their goal and purpose is. And, and those continue now and in the future, uh, regardless of uh, or, or in concert with the uh, military mission. Secretary of State Clinton said she, she feared Libya could become another Somalia. Uh, with groups like uh, Al-Qaeda and the is, uh, Islamic Maghreb, uh, 
is the lack of, 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 of boots on the ground, if you will, uh, leaving an opening for them? Do you need a more robust? Uh, uh, well, we've, the president has made very clear that we are not sending American troops uh, into Libya on the ground. Uh, we are obviously working in a variety of ways to reach out to the opposition in Libya, to uh, uh, advise them on what a uh, post qaddafi Libya uh, would best look like in the sense that, you know, we believe that as with every government, every country in the region, that the, uh, the, the, the government that is most responsive to the, uh, the aspirations and grievances of its people will, will be the most successful. Um, uh, so, you know, those, those consultations are obviously part of our policy. Me, yes. This sounds, might sound like a silly question, but the format of the President's call to the lawmakers, will they be allowed, will it just be him talking or will they be allowed to ask him questions and give him suggestions? On I, I believe it's a conversation. If his uh, update will include, you know, cost analysis of the war, or the, or just not the war, excuse me, of the conflict. I, I, I that may come up. I don't, I, I don't know since it's happening uh, now. Yeah. Do you have any update of when, uh, when we will hear from, or the public will hear from, considering all the confusion everyone's asking about when the, the president's role? Yeah, excuse me. Yeah. The president, I, I can tell you with great confidence, will speak uh, about this uh, in the relatively near future. Uh, will, uh, as part, uh, you know, it, as he has uh, numerous times in the last uh, several days, uh, he believes it's vitally important. It's part of uh, uh, his role as president and commander in chief to speak to the American people about an operation like this, and, and he will do that in the very near future. Near future. And, and I'm not going to give you a time or a day, but in the in the very in the very near future. Uh, not not today, but I, I very near future. And, and I'm not gonna, you guys can pepper me with questions, but I, I don't have any more for you on that. What is the weekly address on, Jay? The weekly address is embargoed, Mark, as you know, so I'm not going to announce the, uh, the subject now. No. Might he mention Libya in the I can, I can, Greek I can tell event? you that whatever he talks about in the weekly address, that if it were to mention Libya, it would not be the only time that he addresses the American people on the subject of Libya, Libya in the very near future. You might save yourself a lot of questions if you put the conference call on the mold. <laughs> <laughs> I'm confident that with the number of people on that call, it's uh, the contents of the on the on the, con the contents of the conversation will be known to you all very soon. Okay. Um, a former Libyan prime minister who was taking part in talks at the African Union today says his country is ready to talk with opposition rebels and accept political reforms, possibly even elections. Are you aware of this? What's your reaction to that? How serious is this offer? Well, I, without addressing the specific offer, we are we are aware of contacts that various members of uh, the regime have made. I'll just say that generally. Uh, but what we don't know is uh, what they amount to in terms of uh, uh, the outcome that they would bear. But we you know we're aware of contacts that are being made. Been specific discussions with this. I'm not going to get into details about that. Okay. And, and why do you think a Gallup poll that was conducted this week shows support for the mission in Libya is the lowest at the start of any U.S. military action in the past three decades? And how high was it? It was 47 percent compared to 51 percent of Americans who approved of Kosovo. I look. I think that the uh, American people have uh, a lot on their mind and a lot on their plate right now. It is. Uh, uh, we're still coming out of a, the worst recession uh, since the Great Depression. Uh, we've uh, been focused, uh, the American people have, as, as well as the government, on the uh, tragic events in Japan. I think there's, it's a lot uh, for, for anybody to um, process. And uh, you know, we're confident that the President's uh, decision uh, is the right one, and he will speak to the American people, as he has in the past, about uh, how he made his decision, what the objectives are, uh, and uh, and why he thinks it's the right thing for the United States and for the American people. Yep. Jay, uh, last week, 64 senators wrote to the president asking him to play a more active role in the long-term budget talks. When they come back in a session next week, what, what should we look for? From well, I think you're referring to, to the, 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 the longer-term issues. Not the, the, not the 
the debt related number. issues. And he, as he has said, uh, very much looks forward to doing that. He believes that it is precisely the path that needs to be taken, a conversation with members of both parties, everybody getting in the boat at the same time so it, it doesn't tip over. And that that's the only way that we can effectively uh, deal with these difficult issues, which have uh, uh, proven so hard to deal with in the past because they are complex and, and politically charged, that the way to do that in, is, is to do it in a bipartisan way <coughs> in a conversation where, where, where a lot of uh, folks from both parties participate. So he, uh, he welcomes that and, and looks forward to doing it. He, he obviously, he and they, uh, the leaders of Congress and the members of Congress, still have some unfinished business to attend to in terms of the uh, finishing up the uh, 2011 uh, fiscal year budget, which is last year's business and needs to be needs to be uh, attended to. So you think that has to be done first before that? I, I think uh, nobody believes that we are open to all sorts of ideas for funding the government uh, for the for the remainder of fiscal year 2011. And you know I've gone through the various parameters the president has set, and the fact that we've come uh, more than halfway. Uh, towards the Republicans, and, and, and negotiations are ongoing at, at many levels. I believe the Vice President, uh, we, we put out the fact that Vice President made some phone calls on this yesterday, and senior, senior administration officials are engaged in these conversations. Uh, and again, without uh, you know, prescribing the, the contents of, of that deal, which is only a one-year deal, what, what I think is irrefutable is that uh, no single-year fiscal deal is going to resolve the long-term debt issues that face us in terms of entitlements, uh, tax expenditures, defense spending, and all the major drivers of long-term debt that have to be addressed. Uh, Barry Bacon. Two, two questions. Does the President still have confidence in Mr. Immelt to run the Jobs, jobs Council? Yes, jobs. he does. Yes, he does. Same question is, uh, Christina Romer this week uh, gave a speech when she said the 8.9% of employment is a, is a, quote, absolute crisis, and um, she said that it's shameful that people in Washington, including the administration and the Federal Reserve, are not doing enough. Does the President agree with those remarks? Has he heard about them? What is his, his reaction? I haven't talked to him about those, but we, we certainly agree that 8.9%, while it is it has come down substantially from its high, is much too high. Uh, that is why the President uh, engaged with uh, Republicans to reach the bipartisan tax uh, cut deal that uh, he reached in the lame duck session in December. Uh, and, and within that deal are uh, a lot of things that uh, address growth, address job creation, uh, and uh, uh, you know, we think will have uh, already been effective in terms of uh, improving the economic picture in the first quarter of this year. So uh, he is- you think you're doing all you can to reduce on the We, we are doing everything we can, working with Congress to, to address these issues. And he's taken dramatic measures, as you know, in the first two years, two plus years of his presidency, uh, because nothing uh, is a higher priority for him than uh, economic growth, job creation, uh, innovation, education, infrastructure uh, as the drivers of economic growth and job creation in the 21st century. There, there is, you know, a lot of folks have, have asked about as we've uh, gone through these uh, significant events in the early part of this year, uh, you know, how, how can he still go out and give speeches on education or the economy? Because uh, first of all, he's President of the United States, and, and uh, it is the responsibility of the President to do many things at once, to keep his focus on, on a number of high priorities. Uh, but secondly, because this is vitally important. That's why he went to South America, because uh, this is a region of the, of the world that will contribute greatly to the, pre uh, to the uh, country's economic growth in the 21st century. So uh, I think his commitment is, is extremely strong on that. With the, Sorry, yeah. Yeah, with the instability in Yemen increasing, and the massive protests and counter-protests today. Is it in the United States' interests that President Saleh stay in power? And has President Obama spoken with him in the last few weeks, either to suggest that he step down or stay, or for any other reason? I, I don't have anything, I don't believe the President has spoken to, to President Saleh, although we can double check that. The, as you know, and I believe we've read out, John Brennan, the Homeland Security Advisor, has uh, on uh, several occasions spoken with him. And, and, but going back to the top of your question, it is not for us to decide the leaders of other countries. We uh, have said to the leadership in Yemen what we have said to the leadership in other countries. Uh, it is not acceptable to use violence against peaceful protesters. We condemn that. Uh, we urge upon the leaders of these countries uh, uh, the idea that they pursue peaceful political dialogue uh, 
with uh, the uh, broad swath of their uh, representatives of, of, of the people of their countries to respond to, uh, you know, there is a reason for these protests and to, and to hear them and respond to them and to reform accordingly. Uh, that's our uh, position in Yemen. It's our position across the region. It has a particular interest for us because it has Al Qaeda in the area. I Arabia think we have, we have interests uh, and, and important relationships across the region. It is a, a, a extraordinarily important region of the world uh, where we have uh, problem relationships and ally relationships. The principles apply to all of them. And uh, we are working with uh, governments in the region, uh, advising them on what we think they should do, that the, the right course of action, the political dialogue, the nonviolent response to these protests, and again, that applies to Yemen, it applies across the region. Jim, can I come back to the civilian protection part of the Libya mission? I know you said that you expect that that's going to be resolved in the next few days, but isn't that a little more, well, not a little, a lot more difficult? Turkey is subjected to uh, participation in airstrikes. Uh, the Germans, of course, are not participating in, in the mission in general military terms. I, what I'm getting at is, is it not a setback that NATO did not take everything under its wing right away? I think we talked yesterday about what days, not weeks, meant, and that we're still not even at one week yet. So we have, uh, before we get to a plural of weeks, we have quite a few number of days left. I, I, a setback? Under what construct could six days, in terms of transfer from uh, the U.S. lead to NATO command and control for the uh, no-fly zone, be uh, a prolonged period of time, and two more days, or several more days, to re uh, resolve the underlying issues of an agreement that has already been reached on civilian protection, the civilian protection aspect, again, that is a very remarkably short period of time. We believe that uh, coalitions, obviously, everybody uh, needs to be consulted. Everybody participates in the agreements and the discussions. That's what coalitions are about. Uh, we think that this has functioned remarkably well, given the circumstances. Yeah, and going on yeah. for weeks. One, one. Wait, 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 what, what? <laughs> Conflict has been going on for weeks, so you can't. Yeah, the military mission was authorized. The military, the military the mission has been happening. As this is day six, right? I believe so. Of the military operation, but the conflict itself. So, the administration, the international. Well, but it was authorized a few days before that. I look. I will not uh, argue with the fact that because of the need to act quickly, that uh, you know every T and was not crossed and every I dotted uh, prior to this. We did not have that luxury, but the. Uh, the reality is that in that environment, uh, the coalition has worked uh, extremely well and extremely quickly to, to come to these uh, agreements. Anne. When you talk about um, this new phase and the United States no longer in the lead, should Americans assume from that that American warplanes will no longer be flying over that area? Will <coughs> the American forces that are still participating be under foreign, uh, a foreign commander? And um, is the impression now that the U.S. doing the jamming and the intelligence is literally kind of out of the combat, less risk to American personnel? Well, I think the, the, the less uh, direct engagement you have, say, to go to start at the end uh, of, uh, of your list of questions, is that it's always risky. There's no question uh, that, that risk will continue just because American forces are in the region uh, in, in advising and assisting as part of this coalition. But the risk would, I think, logically be reduced the, the less, uh, the fewer flights were flying and, and, and the fewer actions we're taking that are kinetic, so to speak. Um, in terms of the specifics of airplanes in the sky, I mean, the, the ratio has gone down dramatically, will continue to go down. Uh, you know, I, I, I believe we have said, I would refer you to the Pentagon for the specifics that on the no-fly zone aspect of this, you know, we will not be participating uh, in the flights, but I, I don't want to you know, on the details, I think the Pentagon has the best uh, information. I think they've been briefing at, uh, at the same time that I've been briefing on this. The members of Congress, after the uh, conversation they had with the President last Friday at noon, complained that they couldn't ask questions the way the conference call was said. Do you know whether he is actually taking questions from I, members? I, I, I don't, I'm not sure that, um, that that's the case. I, my understanding is that there was a discussion, uh, and, and various members did uh, have questions, did have comments in that uh, briefing that the President gave. You're actually with the President Davis at all by telephone. I, I don't know that if we have any physically with the President. We can we can check on that once once we find out who was able to participate. Peter. Um, do you believe the American people understand why we're taking military action in Libya, but say, for example, not Bahrain, where there's also unrest, protests, and a non-democratic form of government? And does he, 
Does the President owe the American people sort of a clear explanation of what the standard is for military intervention in this region? I think that's a, an excellent question. I think the President, as I said, will address in the very near future uh, some of the answers to these questions, uh, or the answers to these specific questions. I think that the American people do expect and will get from this President what they have gotten in the past, which is a very clear explanation of the decisions he makes uh, when he makes the uh, significant decision to uh, engage in military action, to send America's uh, men and women in uniform into harm's way. And I, I think on the, the question of what's different about Libya, I think scale is important here. The, the enormity of the potential uh, violence, uh, well, the, the, the amount of violence that had occurred against civilian populations, but also what was about to occur and the promises made by Gaddafi himself on what he would do to the people of Benghazi were obviously factors in this. Abby? Um, on Tuesday, President Obama, in answer to a question about whether Gaddafi um, what would happen if Gaddafi remained in power, said unless he changes his approach and provides the Libyan people with an opportunity to express themselves freely, and there are significant reforms in the Libyan, gov Libyan government, unless he's willing to step down, there are going to be potential threats. I'm just wondering, is it still a possibility for Gaddafi to make changes to his government to reform, or, or does he absolutely have to go regardless of what reforms? It is our position that he, he needs to leave, that, that he's no longer legitimate. But I think I'm glad that when you re read that quote that you read it to the end where he said, you know, that part of that is stepping down. And, and what I think, you know, what I know the President was saying is, is what we have said and he has said in the past, which is that uh, he is obviously menacing his own people, using violence against his own people. It continues. And uh, as long as he remains in power, it is certainly, uh, given past behavior, uh, not to be expected that he will no longer be a menace to his own pe people. So, uh, you know, we, we believe that uh, like the change of mind that, that we would hope he would reach is uh, to cease and desist the violence and to give up power. In the, context, oh, sorry, in the context of the reports that there are these talks ongoing, um, if, if the consequence of these talks are that um, the Libyan leaders are willing to to go forward with reforms, but that Gaddafi wants to stay in power, we would not accept that as an option. You know, I, I'm not going to entertain that hypothetical because the world as it is complicated enough, so I will stick to what we know and not what we uh, may or may not be able to predict. That's it. Uh, uh, hold on. on. Uh, next. A question. You'll I'm come sure. back to me? I'll tell you what, well, you're, you're saying two questions. How about one? Uh, go for it. Uh, all right. Oh, both, both the Washington Post and the Washington Times report the arrest of 130 illegal aliens in Virginia this week. <clears throat> Is the president gratified or sorry? I, I have uh, no response because I haven't spoken to him about those arrests. I would tell you that the president believes very important uh, that it's very important to enforce our immigration laws. Oh, okay. but that's uh, my can response. I just <laughs> does the president does the president believe that illegal aliens who repeat their invading after being drafted and or <coughs> who commit additional crimes should just continue being sent back or should they be imprisoned? Lester, I'm not even sure I understand your question, but the uh, I will just refer to you what to what I said, which is if they if they're sent back and then Lester, they come back just, again let's just, and repeat their crimes. Do he thinks they should just be sent back or imprisoned? Look, I, the, the president is committed to enforcement of our immigration laws. Yes. Thank you. On, on Syria, does the president think that Assad still has legitimacy, legitimacy to govern? That seems to have been a threshold issue on his policy on Libya. And in Syria, you, you start to see the violence against his own Which people. Which we strongly and, condemn. Exactly. Does he still have legitimacy to govern? Uh, I would just say that we strongly condemn the violence. We urge uh, on the government of Syria what we have urged on the governments in other regions, uh, that they pursue a peaceful course here, that they participate in a political dialogue with their people because that is the, uh, the better path. And, and uh, we uh, also urge the Syrian government to uh, refrain from in any way uh, detaining or uh, human rights activists or journalists or uh, as part of this uh, position. If, he continue, if they continue violence against... There you go with hypotheticals. 
today. It's not a very long stretch to be hypothetical in Syria right now. <laughs> uh, is that a threshold? Is there a, a point at which I don't want to scale on legitimacy to govern. Again, I'm not going to. I'm not going to engage in that uh, hypothetical. I just would would say that our position now is that we strongly condemn what's 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 been happening, uh, and are monitoring it very closely. Yeah. Okay. Yes, sir. Yeah. Yesterday, Secretary Gates said in Tel Aviv that he's carrying a message that it is time to take bold actions towards implementing the two states a solution. Was he carrying a detailed message from the president? Is the president ready to do and make bold actions as, as well to implement the peace process and to have the two states? Well, he, he was certainly, with, without going into any the, the details, the, 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 the secretary was expressing the president's point of view that uh, both sides need to take bold steps towards peace, that that is the only resolution uh, to this vexing problem. Uh, and he encourages both sides to do that. And he, he also, as you know, uh, spoke with Prime Minister Netanyahu and expressed his condolences about the uh, uh, bombing uh, in Jerusalem and, and the other the attacks that they've seen. And, and uh, you know, we urge uh, restraint and we uh, urge both sides to, uh, to take bold steps towards peace. Yeah. Um, you often hear in Washington disquiet about the extent to which some European nations have been cutting their defense budgets and the, the extent to which they are able to kind of join international military operations. Given that, how important is the successful resolution of this Libyan action to proving that, or to ascertaining whether they can actually uh, alleviate the burden on the U.S.? Well, we've been very gratified, Stephen, by the uh, willingness uh, of coalition members to participate uh, in this uh, very important endeavor. And uh, we think it's a sign of the strength of our international partnerships and our, our alliance in the case of NATO. And, and I think that's a, a, a welcome sign about uh, uh, our ability to work uh, together to solve uh, or to address some of these very difficult problems. And, and I, we, we really do think that um, that's an effective way uh, to tackle some of these issues. I'm going to start jumping around here. Yes, here. Thank you, Jay. Given what you mentioned about uh, you reaching out to the opposition, the Libyan opposition, why doesn't the president recognize the uh, interim council in Benghazi as a legitimate representative of Libya? Is he skeptical? And is arming them still a possibility in order to achieve the U.S. policy goal of getting Gaddafi to step down? What I've said in the past is that we are looking at a variety of ways to assist the opposition, uh, and, and that continues. And we have, uh, as you know, the Secretary of State met with the head of the National Council, uh, and, and I, that was a form of recognition about the importance of that body. Uh, but we're not at a point where we're going to pick leaders. Uh, you know, we, we, we think it's very important for, for uh, the Libyan people to, to have a voice in that process. And, I, and I'm not trying to set benchmarks on how this will work. But we are uh, working with the opposition, consulting with the opposition, looking at ways we can assist them, uh, and, and that work continues every day. Yeah. Jay, Carol. Carol. Thanks, Jay. Um, Congressman Braley, a Democrat from Iowa, said that your answer yesterday on the cost of the operations was unacceptable. And I understand, obviously, that you don't want to get into predicting future costs, but why can't you guys say how much has been spent so far over the six days or even just last weekend? Well, I don't, I don't have the, the figures, uh, Kara, and, I, and, I, and I'm certain that part of our consultations with Congress will uh, address this issue. But what we have said is that we feel confident, given the uh, nature and the uh, limitations on the mission, that it can be paid for within existing uh, budget appropriations because the, there are funds that exist uh, for that purpose. Uh, Mr. Sheridan, I see your hands up there. Welcome back. Actually, thank you. He had my question. Okay. Okay. Well, I, I Congratulations, by the way. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, the, I mean, it, assistance to the opposition, you've ruled out, just to be clear, non uh, military assistance, right? Well, I, I'm not aware. I mean, I think that we actually, if you're, there, there was a, a few weeks ago the statement that the arms embargo prevented us from doing that, and in fact, the, the, the there's flexibility within that to take that action if, if we thought that were the right way to go. So it's still a possibility I think that that's right, yeah. 
who we got? All the way in the back. Yes, sir. Blue shirt. Thank Sorry. you, Jake. Can you clarify something you said earlier? You said the U.S. Uh, would remain committed to the coalition as long as it takes to keep the civilians safe. So is the military participation from the U.S. coalition dependent? If the coalition dissolves, will then the military participation from the U.S. also go away? The world is complicated enough. For me, not. It is hypothetical. You're saying if something happens, will the U.S. do something? Has stressed so many times the importance of the coalition in going in, and so if that's the case, then someone has to have raised that question in the national security my, meeting. My understanding, my reading of Resolution 1973, it does not have a time limit on it. It is uh, says that coalition will, will use all necessary measures to. Coalition limit. I don't read one in it. Do you? The, the, uh, we will use all necessary measures to protect Libyan civilians. Yeah. Take one more. Yes, ma'am, all the way back. Yeah. Sarah. Sarah, sorry. sorry. <laughs> Thank you. The president just came back from Brazil, Chile, and Panama, as you know. And is he going to visit Puerto Rico sometime <laughs> this year? Uh, I don't have any travel announcements for you, but, uh, well, I don't have any travel announcements for you. Thank you. Bye-bye. <laughs> hey, Jay, we got it. We got it. Oh, oh. Panama. El Salvador. Never mind. Uh, sorry, the week ahead. Uh, well, this is what we have. On Monday, the president will participate in a town hall hosted by Univision at Bell Multicultural High School in Washington, D.C. At this town hall, the president will have the opportunity to talk with students parents and teachers about education and Hispanic educational attainment. The town hall will be broadcast on the Univision network on March 28th at 7 p.m. Eastern Time and Pacific Time and 6 p.m. Central Time. On Tuesday, the president will travel to New York City to deliver remarks at the dedication of the Ronald H. Brown United States Mission to the United Nations building. And on Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday, the president will attend meetings at the White House. That is that is your uh, week ahead. I, I don't have an announcement. That's not what you were alluding, alluding to earlier. No announcement. Thanks.